Well, happy birthday, church. I'm uh, 38 years. It's a long time to do anything, to live or to conduct business in such a way that an organization or a group of people continue to thrive and grow. And I'm grateful to God for his sustaining power because there were opportunities whereby this thing would not be in existence if we had done the wrong thing. And uh, the Lord saved us, the Lord helped us, the Lord equipped us, the Lord strengthened us. And for that, we are, we are very, very grateful. And in these moments, I'd like to recognize just some people that are instrumental to your founding. Mark and Debbie Stant. Mark and Debbie Cock came here in 1982. They were the founding pastors of this church. And I was serving them as one of their staff members. I was 21 years old, didn't know what I was doing. My job was to establish a campus ministry at Howard University, which we did and is still going. The church downtown that we planted 21 years ago is continuing on with that outreach. But Mark and Debbie were in charge of three or four outreaches to the campus, of which I was one, different campuses in the area, and they were in charge of planting the church here. And uh, it's good to have them with us, and thank you very much for your sacrifice. The last uh, few days, uh, every, every anniversary month, we fast. We as a congregation believe that we can find ourselves in a better position to hear from God and respond to him well when we fast. It sensitizes our soul. It makes our ear better able to hear, spiritual ear better able to hear what God wants to speak to us. And so we fast pretty regularly. We've got eight, excuse me, 11 scripted days out of the year where we fast. Five at the beginning of the year, consecrating ourselves to God. Three before our resurrection service, Easter. And then three during the um, period of our anniversary. And those are moments when we as a congregation come together and say, Lord, speak to us. Use us more efficiently. Help us to be better tools in your hand. And fasting is one of those things that is misunderstood. It's, it's not a hunger strike. It's not twisting God's arm and saying, we won't eat until you do. It is saying, Lord, the thing that I need most on the planet to sustain my life, I'm willing to give up to get you. I got to have food to live, but I need you more. And so I choose to sacrifice that to get more of you. That kind of posture puts you in a position where you can hear better, so you can do better, so we can be better for the community. That's why we fast. And God does something all the time in our fast. And I want to thank all of you who participated on Friday night with our prayer and fasting meeting. It was an extraordinary time in God. The Holy Spirit came in a significant way here. And those of you who participated online, thank you, thank you, thank you. And all of you who gave up food for three days, I know it's hard. I like to eat too. I really do. I, I woke up this morning. I, I have a scale in my bathroom and I weigh every day and I, I, I'm Okay. But I, every once in a while, I just say, Lord, is there any way that I could have as much as I want in terms of calories and not gain any weight? I mean, I, I, have, I have not a sweet tooth. All of my teeth, every one of them enjoys sweets. Krispy Kreme sends me emails to my email address. And I save them because they have special deals on dozens. I love sweets. I really do. And I've just been begging God, please, as I get older, my metabolism gets less. It doesn't work as well, and I have to work out harder in order to keep myself at the way I should be. And say, Lord, listen, I've trained so long now. It's been 25 years of working out every day almost in my life, and I'm begging you, give me a break. <laughs> Let me just eat without having to kill myself. It doesn't happen. And so I love to eat. I really do. But I love God more. And I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it takes, whatever it takes, in order to see us be what we need to be to win our city. Can't do it on our own. We need the rest of the body of Christ, but we need to do our part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turn with me over to the book of Matthew. We're going to talk about religion and relationship today. Religion and relationship. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to look at verses 34 through 
through 40. Verses 34 through 40. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him, saying, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, verse 36, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. 39. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Lord, help us as we study your word. We're going to talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious order that was set up during the day of Christ. And then we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus always passes tests that we give him. Always. The religious people of Christ's day didn't trust Jesus. They wanted to figure out how in the world they could either diminish his influence with the people with, with, with whom they had influence or get him on their side, one of the two. So they worked really, really hard to try to embarrass him in public, hoping that the people would then side with the religious leader rather than Jesus. They would, the people then would lose confidence. And so in a prior verse, it says that the Sadducees were asking him a question that seems really crazy to us as we read it. Because the Sadducees were a group of people who were primarily priests, but they didn't believe in a resurrection. The Pharisees were a group of people that believed in the law and the literal, the, 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 excuse me, the, the interpretation of the law more than the literal reading of the law. The Sadducees actually believed in the literal reading of the law. Both of them believed in the law. They just believed in it differently. And the Sadducees came asking Jesus a question related to the resurrection. They said, we know that Moses said in the law that if a man marries a woman and the woman doesn't have any children and the man dies, that the brother of the man needs to come and marry the woman and raise up a son in the, in the deceased brother's name. Now, here's a case. A man was married to a woman. They had no children. The man dies. The man's brother comes and marries the woman. They don't have any children. That brother dies. Another brother comes and marries the woman. He dies and they have no children. Ultimately, seven brothers altogether marry this woman and none of them have any children. At the resurrection, who is going to be her husband? I mean, I can almost look at, I can see Jesus going. That is your most important question. When you think, when y'all get together and say, what can we, what can we trip him up on? That's what you came up with? That's the best you can do? Well, and Jesus, he uses some very strong language here. He says, you don't know the law, neither the power of God. You're clueless on both. You don't understand that when people go to heaven, they're like angels. They neither are married or given in marriage. You're not concerned about how you prioritize your relationships and glory because they all are loved the same way. You're not overly tied to one against another. That's what happens. There's something that, that occurs when you get to glory. And, and then, then Jesus says, you are overly wrong in your assumption. That's the language he uses. You could not be more mistaken in your thinking. Sadducees. And then on the heels of that, the Pharisees come. They say, okay, well, let's ask, we'll ask him a question. We'll get him on, on an interpretation of the law. They're like 612, and he's got to have the perfect answer. Which one, which law is the most important? Now, remember, all of these people are not trying to figure out how in the world they can get to know Jesus better, who is the representation and the image of God on the earth. They are trying to stump him so that they can have greater influence with the people and use the law for their own benefit. Their religious life is so centered around all that they do, they have lost the importance of relationship with the Father. All they want is to make sure people are compliant with the rules, not that they are attached to him. And religion is super important, y'all. Please do not interpret 
any of what I'm saying today as somehow pitting religion against relationship. I am grateful for religion, good religion. Religion that helps people understand how they are to track their way in, in progress toward God. I'm, I'm grateful for good religion that answers people's questions when they don't have the answer to what they need to do next and, and directs them in the right way. Otherwise, they're going to make a mistake. They're going to do something wrong. I am grateful for religion that helps us know when we need to get together and worship. I am grateful for religion that guides me regularly into the understanding of how I need to treat my brother when I don't want to treat him the right way. When I'd like to do something really different. Religion helps me say, <sighs> restrains my soul. Religion helps. And the only re reason, religion, which are rules that help guide toward best conduct. That's all religion is. Rules that help guide toward best conduct. The only region, reason religion was created because man couldn't figure out the right thing to do. So God said, let me help you. Let me give you some rules. Let me give you some, some guidelines here. Religion is bad when two things happen. When we use it as a substitute for our relationship and a replacement for our relationship. Bad. Or we use it to somehow further our own cause against somebody else's that we use it for our benefit and somebody else loses in the process. Those two things, not good. And unfortunately, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious order, the, the main body of government of the day when Jesus was around, used religion for both of those bad reasons. They had political uh, reasons and, 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 and uh, motivations for what they did. And they wanted to make sure they kept their status and would make sure that they used the rules in order to pump themselves up and push other people down. Jesus blasted them in Matthew 23. The Pharisees come and say, what is the greatest law? Not, how can I get to know God better? What is the greatest law? And Jesus says, greatest law is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Until you can figure out how to do that, please do good religion. Please practice things that will help you do right until you can figure out how to love them right. When you figure out how to love them right, you won't need your religion. <laughs> when I got married, before I got married, I read seven books on marriage. And... I, I, I asked my bride to marry me in August. We were getting married in December. I read all seven in four months. I wanted to know everything that needed to be done. What was required to be an excellent husband? I wanted to get it all right. The home in which I grew up was not as right as it should have been. They loved me. They were great parents. But they didn't know how to be husband and wife very well. I didn't have a template. In fact, Mark and Debbie were the only people I had ever seen, Mark and Debbie Cog, that had a great marriage. And so I said, Lord, I want one like that, but I don't know how to do it. So help me and my personality get to be right so I can do right for my bride. And I was devouring information, just spending time over it. And back, back then, there was no Kindle. You had to actually go to a library. You had to go to a Barnes and Noble and pick up some things called books that, that were bound and, and, and open them and read them and have highlighters, little markers that allowed you to read words. And I said, I'm equipped. I said, I do. We went on our honeymoon, came back, and I was doing everything the book said. And my bride looked at me and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm loving you. <laughs> she said, no, you're not. I know you love me, but why are you doing this? And why, why are you all? It seems like you're so robotic, like you've got a script that you have to follow in order for things to go well today for you and me. I said, yes, that is exactly right. I have a script. I've got it written out here what I need to do today. 
And, and, and you're a part of that. I prayed for you. I, 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 I tried to make sure the bathroom was clean. I, 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 I've, I've done all, I paid the bill. I've done everything I need to do. And it's one of these, I'm looking at her looking for affirmation and a pat on the head. You're a good husband. And I did all other little stuff that she just looked at. And that was good. It was all good. Nothing was bad. But it was so formulaic that I had lost the relational aspect. And she said, Brett, is my name in any of those books? <laughs> I got so depressed. I just thought, you mean I read those for nothing? I read all those books for nothing. You mean I got to figure this thing out? I got to figure this thing out according to how you want me to love you. Yes. And it took me a while. It took me a while. I'm the guy. I'm that dude that did stupid. I've told you many times. I'll say it again. First at it, first a uh, Valentine's Day. She told me uh, she wanted a, a, a you know she, she cleaning the house and she she really needed a new vacuum cleaner. And so I went to Sears. Valentine's Day. I thought I could kill, you know, two birds with one stone. It was Valentine's Day. It's a true story, and it's so sad. I got this vacuum cleaner, and I, I, I was so proud. I told the lady who, I was, who was checking me out, she said, is, is this for your bride, your wife? I said, yes. I said, I got it, got it for her for Valentine's Day. She said, I'm sure she'll like it. And I didn't even hear her sarcasm. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. I just thought, oh, that's good. I've done well. I brought it home. Happy Valentine's Day. And my wife looked at me and she went, thank you. Oh, she was so kind. She was so kind. But it was one of those thank yous where I said, I did bad, didn't I? I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't love you right again. <laughs> I blew it again. I loved me when I was trying to love you, because I wouldn't have to pay for two things. I get it, okay. Until you can figure out how to love God well, it'll be okay if you do religious stuff, but it ought to be on the way to relationship. And after 33 years, I haven't figured her all right. Any man who says he has figured out his bride is lying. I don't care how long you've been married to her. You may know some stuff, but you don't know her. Because she changes like every month. <laughs> Things just, just are different. And, and we're not smart enough to be able to keep up. We're just not. It's, it's an adventure of a man's life to try to determine who his wife is. And you never need to go find anybody else because you always have somebody new. <laughs> always got somebody new. Always somebody new. But I have figured her out more than I used to. And I do know how to love her better. And your religion is supposed to be a tutor to help you get to the place where you can love. If you're still doing the elementary rudimentary stuff that you did because you believe it's going to help you in your, your, your acceptance before God that you did when you first got born again and you're 20 years down the road and you haven't figured out how to love him with all of your heart but you're doing it by rules and regulations and religion, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I do not get up and read my Bible every day because I have to. I, I do it because I love them. I do it because I want to know more about them. I don't memorize my Bible because I feel like it's a part of my job description. I do it because my soul must be fed. And if I can get a reservoir down here of who he is, I can understand how I can love him better. I get to know him more when I read the Bible. I'm not reading it in order to define my boundaries on a regular basis. I'm reading it in order to gain greater intimacy with him. Religion without relationship can grow to be something that is dangerous. It can, it can grow to be something by which you not only judge your own conduct, but everybody else around you. And now the things that you do really well, and you see other people not doing so well, you begin to think they're less than. Why don't, you read? Why don't you go to church on a regular basis? Oh, look at you, drinking that alcohol. 
smoking no cigarettes. We begin to judge people wrongly because our religion gets in the way. The Pharisee said, help me with this. Now, I'm not quite sure they had the right answer. I think that they were developing the right answer in their generation because we don't see this particular question being posed in any part of the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament. No place. And this is the first place where it is posed to somebody who might have an answer that could confirm what everybody has been feeling now in the first century A.D. What is the greatest commandment? Now Micah helped us a little bit. The 612, there were 10 commandments and there were Levitical laws, ceremonial laws, there were dietary laws, and then there were case laws based on the 12, I mean the 10 commandments that we have that allow us to understand what does murder look like and what does theft look like. If a guy's out there chopping a tree down with an ax and his ax head flies off and hits another guy and the guy dies, is that murder? No, that's something else. It's still not good, it's still wrong, but it's something else. If a guy accidentally hits somebody and he dies, is that murder? No, that's something else. It's still wrong, but it's something else. And so you have case law. Micah then breaks it down in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He says, what is it, O man, that God requires of you to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? The distillation of the law came down to those three things for that generation. And now we see the distillation of the law coming down to one commandment that is actually tied by two. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now the interesting thing is that Jesus takes these two things that are not mentioned together in the Old Testament. But he ties them together in the New. And you really can't get the weight of it until you understand the context of the Old. Here we have Moses. Having been with these people for 40 years out of the wilderness, he's had enough of them, really. Because not only has he had to endure with them for 40 years, but he perceives that they are the ones that are stopping him from going into the promised land. Right about year 38 or so, they're quarreling. They're not happy. They're looking at Moses saying, we need water to drink, and you're not a very good leader for not taking us to water. God goes to Moses and says, listen, I'm going to give him water. All you got to do is talk to that rock. Water will come out. But Moses is mad. He's been with these people 38 years. The distance from from Egypt to the promised land was about 11 days. It took the Israelites 40 years. 11 days. And Moses wasn't at fault. He wasn't happy. And never once had they thrown him a celebration to to really admire and thank him for his leadership. All they had done is tried to throw off his leadership at the Red Sea while they were in the wilderness. We don't know where this man Moses is. Let's go ahead and establish a new God for us. Aaron, you can lead us. Time and time again, we don't ever see the Israelites ever saying thank you to Moses. And now they're complaining again. This is the tenth time that they have complained about whether God is going to provide for them in the wilderness. And every time he has done it. And now they're mad at Moses, and Moses is mad at them. He said, you stiff-necked and rebellious people. You've been this way. You will always be this way. Here's your water. And he took his staff and hit that rock. No water came out. First time Moses did something that he felt was in the realm of instruction from God and nothing happened. Well, the reason was God said, talk to the rock, not hit the rock. So here God was trying to give Moses an out, saying, wait, 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 wait. That's not what I instructed you to do. And Moses was using the same religious format he had earlier. See, this same thing happened as the children of Israel were entering into their wilderness period. They didn't have any water. And when when that happened and they complained to Moses, God said to Moses, strike the rock. And he struck it and water came out. One strike, water came out. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 
that Paul says that the rock that actually sprung forth that water, that followed them in the wilderness, was Christ. The first time, God said, strike the rock. The second time, God said, speak to the rock. Why? Well, Jesus has only struck once. When he struck once, the redemptive benefit flows from the cross. After that, you don't need to strike him again. He doesn't need to die again to get you provision. All you got to do is ask. Are you listening to me? Just ask. Just ask. Speak to the rock and the water will come out. Moses was so mad. He drifted back. See, when you're not in the spirit, you'll drift back to your religion. You'll do what, come, what, what you've learned to do rather than what relationally you should do. He struck the rock, nothing happened. He struck it again and water came out. Why did water come out the second time? Because God wanted the people to be provided for and he realized Moses is not going to listen to me. Hmm. God told Moses, well, that's it. You're not going to the promised land. Yeah, you're kidding me, right? Like I no, no, you because you got no, oh Lord, and it says that he argued with God so much, and I haven't heard God say this to anybody else in Scripture, at least good people. God said this: Do not pray to me about this anymore. <laughs> he just kept talking. God, please let me go. Lord, come on now. I mean, 40 years I've been dealing with these re rebellious, evil. You know how they are. I mean, one time I blow it. One time I fly off the handle and you're going to disqualify me? Yes. <laughs> Moses blamed the people. And so here he is. Now dealing, Deuteronomy is the second generation. It's the second given to the law. Dude is two, second time, and then Nomi is law. It's the second given to the law. The first generation has passed away. Second generation is there. He's given the law a second time to the second generation who's going to go into the promised land without him. And for the first five chapters, he basically gives a history lesson of how they've been wandering in the wilderness and how they got to where they were and the victories and the battles and, and the provision and all. And he gets to chapter six. And at the end of chapter 5, he had given them the law. Ten commandments. One more time. Gave them the law one more time. And then he says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul. The interesting thing about this and it's almost as if after 40 years of struggle and pain and disappointment and then giving the people the law and then realizing that the first generation had the law and they didn't do it, what makes me think the second generation is? And you almost get the sense that Moses is saying, let's try something new. Not just the law. Let's be passionate about God. This is the first time in all of the Bible where somebody is exhorting somebody else or a group of people to love God. Every other place, it's obey him. And I'm not trying to separate the two, but I am making a distinction. Then Moses is saying, love ought to be the motivation for your following him, not just trying to figure out how you can obey each command. Because if you love him right, each command will follow. <laughs> it's the first time, first time. First time. Exasperated Moses says, I tried it with the first generation. It didn't work. I don't think it's going to work with you because you're the same version of Adam as they are. Let's do this. Let's love them. Give all your heart to them. The second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the interesting thing about <clears throat> the love of the Lord your God is that Moses came up with that. It wasn't one of these, thus says the Lord. It wasn't something that God was speaking to Moses and then Moses had to, had to utter. Moses came up with that. And it's almost like, like one of those things that we would, we would not expect someone to do as we 
wouldn't think God would do. Meaning, if you have to tell somebody to love you, what's the point? Hey, will you please love me? You think, ah, ah. And so Moses tells the people to love God. But the second part of this, Leviticus 19, God gives sundry laws whereby he's telling people, this is how you relate to your neighbor. Don't be mean to him. Don't defraud him. Don't lie on him. Don't hate him. If he does bad to you, don't kill him. Don't try to take out vengeance. He gives a whole bunch of regulations. And then this is the Lord speaking, not Moses. But this is Moses speaking by the Lord. He says, and love your neighbor in verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That is a command from Almighty God to his people about how they ought to treat one another. So we've got a beautiful witness here, too. We have the leader of God's people telling God's people how they ought to relate to him. And then we have God telling his people how his people ought to relate to one another. And the two of those wind up being the inexorable commandments that allow people to respond to every situation best. Jesus said all the law and the commandments hang on these two things. Oh, he passed this test. And he set in order not a new commandment, but a new way of looking at how the law needs to be fulfilled. I love religion that is done well, but religion that is done best is that which is motivated by loving God and loving people greatly. I beg you, if your heart is cold, let God begin to warm it. If you're trusting just in the formalities of life in order for your relationship with God to be upheld, if you're just reading your Bible by road, if you're coming to church because you got to, if you're going to small group because it happens to be 7 o'clock on a Wednesday, I'm begging you, let your heart begin to be engaged so that it motivates you to do all the right stuff rather than doing the right stuff somehow fulfilling you in, in such a way that you think you're going to be now uh, commendable before God. Because there is nothing, listen, there is nothing we can do to impress God. Remember, he made the world in six. Anybody touch that? <laughs> There's, the best we can do doesn't even come close to the worst he can do. And there is no worst. Whatever he does is great. But we can't impress him. Our good works are supposed to be those which emanate from a heart of love that reflect how much we care about him and how much we care about everybody else. Our good works are not to be those which somehow we use as commendations to say, see, look, you must accept me now. He is unimpressed. This is why he says in the book of Isaiah in first chapter, stop bringing me your sacrifices. I don't want them anymore, even though they were prescribed. He said, stop it. What I'm looking for is your heart. You're using these things to replace that which I want most. And I'm not going to take them as a replacement. I want your heart. And if you give me your heart, I've got everything else. But if you give me stuff, I may not have your heart. And you might just drift. May God help us to love him. And the word love there is agape. It's where we get the idea of unconditional commitment. We're not loving God in order for him to do stuff for us. We're loving him because he has done stuff for us. We're loving him because of who he is. We're loving him because of, 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 of what he has done with respect to redemption, that if he never does another thing for us, if he never brings any provision to our life, if our life seems to go right down the tube, spiraling down tanks, we ought to be grateful every day that we just aren't going to hell. Amen. He has done enough for Brett. 
He doesn't need to do another thing. Now I'm believing him to do a lot more because I'm still breathing on the planet. There's more stuff I got to do. So I need him in order to get it done. I can't do it on my own. But I am not judging him on the basis of what he does tomorrow to figure out whether I need to serve him. He's done enough for Brett. And sometimes I just need to wake up every day reminding myself, whoa, I ain't going to hell. It's a good day. I don't care what happens bad. It's a good day. I am not going to hell. Hallelujah. Love him unconditionally. Unconditionally. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and grace. Inspire us as a people to be the kind of folks that can love you the way we should. If there are folks here who are still needing tutoring lessons to get to the place of love, teach them quickly. Is there anybody this morning who has yet to give their heart to Christ? Maybe you've made a decision in the past, but your life doesn't look anything like what a believer's ought to be today, and you want to make a change. You want to come on home. If you fit in either of those categories, raise your hand high. I want to pray for you. If you're online, you can acknowledge that by checking the box in the chat at the very bottom and saying, I want to give my heart to Christ. I see that hand. Once it's up, you can put it down. Bless you. Once it's up, you can put it down. Anybody else? I see those hands. All right, you who raised your hands and you who are online, pray with me. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me. I am sorry for the way I've led. I'm sorry for the way I've lived. I choose to turn away from everything I know to be sin and to follow you with all of my heart. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for giving me the privilege of calling Jesus the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we've got a new believer's toolbox. Ah, boy, that's an old statement. We've got a new believer toolkit here that we want to give you. If you'll come to the information desk out there, there's a Bible, there's a Bible study, pen and a pad in here that will help you understand what next steps look like. If you're online, there's another box at the bottom of the chat. Check that and somebody will follow up with you about the commitment you made so that you can be successful in your decision making. By the way, if you need prayer for anything, go to the top of the chat, check that, and a pastor will be in contact with you, a prayer coordinator, who will pray with you about your most important needs.